It is so great to be here with you. I'm Alicia Benson and I'm the CEO of Greater Spokane Incorporated. The State of the City address and the State of the City mayoral address has become a cornerstone of an events here in our community. And for the first time ever, we're simultaneously streaming live on Facebook as well. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor today, the City of Spokane Mayor, Nadine Woodward. Mayor Woodward is a partner, collaborator and convener of people with different ideas, perspectives and passions to build new momentum and lead through challenges related to the protection of public health and civil discourse and minimizing the impacts of natural disasters. Under Woodward's leadership, the city of Spokane has built and grown relationships that have increased police officer visibility and community engagement, fostered regional collaboration to meet the needs of the unhoused in our community, accelerated street improvements, kept utility rates affordable, made neighborhood waste collection more efficient, and worked closely with businesses and professional organizations to support their economic investments, all while working closely with regional and state partners to protect the health and safety of our individuals and our businesses. Her efforts are part of a plan to advance public safety, homelessness, housing, and economic development priorities to keep Spokane at the leading edge of innovations and advancements that make Spokane a place she loves to call home. So I'd like to welcome Mayor Nadine Woodward. Thank you, Alicia, and happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Life's unexpected twists and turns make for unique opportunities. New variables and obstacles force us to pivot quickly or risk falling further and further behind. Evaluation of resources and priorities suddenly occurs through a whole new lens, and yesterday's direction becomes obsolete. We were reminded of that early and repeatedly in 2020. The past year has been all about listening, learning, adapting, supporting, flexing, partnering, and collaborating. It was undeniably difficult, challenging, relentless, and so many other things. The experience taught us countless lessons about how to get things done. To list them all individually is to guarantee some will be missed. And to lump them all together seems in a way to minimize the tremendous work, commitment, and dedication our community has shown in the face of unceasing adversity. Thank you for this opportunity to be together today. I am excited to deliver the State of the City Address from a new one-of-a-kind indoor sports venue set to open this fall. As you look behind me over what will soon be a world-class hydraulic track, the Podium Sportsplex is the perfect backdrop to talk about where we are as a community. The athletes who will compete here will face adversity in their journeys. They'll push through setbacks all while keeping their eyes focused squarely on the prize if they hope to finish on top of the podium. In many ways, that drive and determination parallels the grit that our great community is showing right now. So a big thank you to the Public Facilities District and Leidig Construction for letting us give you a sneak peek today. We also want to thank Great Earth Spokane Incorporated and Alicia Benson and her team for inviting this discussion about the future of our city. Now, as much as any point in memory, is the time to pull people together, to speak honestly, exchange ideas, and find ways that we can become a resource multiplier. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the local and state elected officials and other government agency partners who have joined us today. They will continue to be important. They'll be important collaborators in our advancement as a city, region, and state. One COVID year ago, our focus was on public safety, housing, homelessness, and economic development. 
Those priorities haven't changed, even if how we deliver on them looks a whole lot different. People ask me all the time if being mayor is what I expected it would be. While there's no way any of us could have foreseen how the grips of this pandemic would impact the work we all do, given some time to reflect, the fundamental job of mayor in leading the state's second largest city remains the same. My job is to bring people together, to connect people to ideas, remove roadblocks, have tough conversations, listen often, and speak up when needed. It's to find opportunities where there are challenges and foster partnership and collaboration whenever possible. That's true of our conversations around pandemic responsiveness, and it applies equally to the national debate about transition of power, police accountability, and reform. We're relying heavily on collaboration to deliver fair and sustainable labor agreements, shift to a truly regional resource model to address homelessness, and gain a shared understanding of our housing needs. Partnerships are reigniting the economy, increasing police community engagement, expanding recreational and tourism opportunities, and meeting mental health needs. We're working together to plan for the next evolution of the downtown environment, developing and growing community amenities, and thinking and planning strategically. Our partners are helping us prepare for and respond to natural disasters, working with healthcare partners to vaccinate the region's first responders and frontline workers, and so many other things that keep our city running, our community safe, and this region advancing. That's a long list of city responsibilities, and by extension, conversations that I, as mayor, get involved with in many different ways. Each is an opportunity to invite new ideas, to look at things from different perspectives, and to work together. That, as much as anything, is what the past year and what this year is all about. That includes our internal city organization. We have transitioned to priority-based budgeting to better connect our resources to the areas that support community and economic growth, build depth for succession planning, and emphasize communication and collaboration above all else. The more highly functioning we are as an organization, the better prepared we are to deliver on community priorities. That work started long before this pandemic hit. And I really credit the previous administration and city council and the current administration and council for working together to put the city on solid financial footing. That allowed the city to direct state and federal pandemic relief dollars to community programs that are making a real difference in individuals, families, and businesses rather than shoring up our operations. So today, you'll hear from many people who remind us of the incredible talent right here in our own community and their desire to work together. Our willingness as a community to set aside differences in the name of collaboration is a truly powerful trait that sets Spokane apart. We'll talk about police officers and behavioral health specialists working side by side to help people in crisis. You'll hear about partnerships forged out of pandemic necessity that allowed us to celebrate community traditions. And we'll highlight neighborhood businesses that have put their livelihoods on the line to keep our community safe. Our discussion will include examples of turning the desperation of this pandemic into a long-term opportunity to meet the immediate shelter needs of our most vulnerable, connect them to services, and find a way to get them into stable housing. You'll also get a look at the real needs Spokane has in the rental and ownership housing markets and the work that is beginning to coalesce there. Mostly though, you'll hear a story about how Spokane has done things a little differently. Where the rest of the nation has been at heated and stubborn odds with each other, we have found a way to redirect the energy that comes from its differences toward a much more productive outcome. Spokane has replaced what we've always done with an openness to new ideas. We've given each other the space to be heard and the respect to listen first so that we can have dialogue instead of just loud debate. You may have heard me say this before, but it's something I truly believe. When you talk, you repeat what you already know. When you listen, you learn. And to Spokane's great credit, we have done a lot of learning over the past 12 months. And that, as much as anything, is how a community grows. I tell people all the time, I am extremely fortunate that I don't have to do my job alone. We have a great team of 2,000 employees to do the heavy lifting every day. They make sure streets are paved and clear, the water comes on, wastewater is treated before it enters our river, our parks are safe and clean, traffic lights work, garbage is hauled away, people are connected to services, and someone answers your call for help. 
Those same employees are also responsible for the many, many partnerships that we have with other jurisdictions, organizations, and associations. As great as our employees are, and they are amazing, we are many times better when we invite the experience, expertise, and resources of our partners to solve challenges and identify new opportunities to make Spokane a place you want to get an education, find employment, start a family, invest in a business, come to relax and recreate, and stay to enjoy your golden years. All of that starts with the work that we do every day as a city organization and as a community. Take, for example, the new downtown police precinct. Finding a way to improve visibility and engagement to change the perception of the downtown environment was my top priority coming into office. Downtown Spokane is the region's hub for employment, shopping, dining, and entertainment. It has recreation, housing, and transportation. It is equal parts of front porch view of the community, heartbeat of the region's economy, and mixing place, where a city with diverse users and needs comes to coexist. So finding a way to encourage those interactions in a way that honors the many reasons people use our downtown requires delicate balance and continuous refinement. When the downtown police precinct opened last summer, it increased visibility and fulfilled a promise that I made to enhance engagement between officers and our community. The precinct is staffed with a team of 16 officers, including a captain, lieutenant, sergeant, and detective. It's also home to the department's behavioral health unit, which pairs mental health professionals with officers. And that unit is growing by two more teams this year. In the past year, the co-deployment model has kept people experiencing a crisis from going to jail or the hospital 78% of the time. Arrests accounted for just 1% of the more than 3,700 local contacts. Pairing officers with mental health professionals saved the Spokane Police Department more than 1,300 hours and 2,100 calls for service over the past nine months. That connection to services for those in crisis and protection of police resources for others is significant. And building on that success, the downtown precinct, precinct recently expanded its coverage area east to Sherman Street to improve responsiveness and better utilize the skill sets of those mental health professionals. Downtown officers who use bicycles as part of the patrol when weather allows have also piloted electric bikes as a quicker, nimble, and environmentally friendly response tool that will decrease officer fatigue during intense responses. We're all very excited that you know, we can be in a, a new, very functional facility um, right kind of down in, the, in this business district where we think we're going to be much more visible. Um, and I, I think the officers are really excited about it. So here's the, the entrance and the reception area where we'll, where we'll have a desk officer. Yeah, looks good. Wow, it's really taking shape. So we've got the four new bodies and a sergeant position that the mayor gave us and uh, we were assigned to the downtown precinct primarily with an emphasis on bike patrols and foot patrols and just making ourselves more visible to the, the public. The collaboration is what made this happen. You can't just have an administration or just council members saying this is a good thing. You have to have that teamwork and that effort together to make things move forward. And that's what we did here. I'm Officer Richie Plunkett and wanted to just come and talk to you and heard you guys are new to the neighborhood. So if you need us, you can come down there. We have a front desk officer. We can always assist you that way or you can just call us and we're a couple uh, blocks away. We knew what people want is to feel safe downtown. And whether you're a business owner or even if you're a homeless person, you want to feel secure and safe downtown. And having police on the ground, on foot, on bicycles, a, a building that's open 24-7 that people know that they can go to if they're feeling unsafe is what we needed. We had an incident happen a few weeks ago where we had a lady that had broken in um, and they were here in minutes to make sure that my employees felt safe um, and then they also they knew who it was. The mayor and the city council president did something unprecedented for our area. They, they worked together and collaborated to work with the guild and sit down in face-to-face -face conversations 
to work through the contract. It provided clarity on what civilian oversight looks like. It also enhanced the authority of, of the civilian oversight in all parties, including the Ombudsman, had some input into that, that contract and what that final product was. Doing all right? Doing okay? You need a new hat? You sure? Hello, hello, hello. You're okay, you're okay. What did you take? I'm not trying to arrest you, what did you take? Is there any way that you could go over the HOC right now? Okay, thank you man, appreciate it. He's schizophrenic, according to his mom, off his meds. Hey Wayne, my name's Jenny. Have you been sleeping lately? With everything you got going on, are you having any thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself or hurt anyone else? Happy Monday, everybody. Today is the first day of our expanded borders. Anything east of Division all the way over to Sherman, and then third down to the encompassing the new University District is all part of our jurisdiction now and our responsibilities. Happy to have you guys in the neighborhood. Makes it really easy for me to come over here and have a snack and check on you and make sure everything's fine. Two, three. That precinct is making a difference as we speak. Having just the increased level of staff, thanks to our council and to the mayor, and then having them positioned right in the core, having the advent of the mental health team, uh, couldn't be more welcoming to our team uh, because now uh, you know we're just gonna be that much more effective working together, uh, making downtown that much better and brighter. Those are the kinds of people and partnerships working to foster and grow the environments and supports you desire in Spokane. It's worth noting that work comes with its share of challenges. Probably the most common feedback that we receive is a desire for progress to open at a much more rapid rate. We share that urgency and acknowledge that people on all sides of the conversation are feeling fatigued. We're working quickly and smartly to incorporate feedback and balance the many different perspectives. Historically, Spokane's housing market has plugged along at a slow, affordable growth rate that's kept demand relatively manageable and housing attainable. That lack of intensity, though, has served as a bit of a false relief valve to a market that has been inching toward diminished supply for many, many years. Finding a place for people to live is another significant part of the work that is advancing Spokane. Generations of homeowners have assumed that their children and grandchildren would also be able to afford a home. As supply has tightened and prices have risen, the number of people who have serious doubts about being able to achieve home ownership is growing much more rapidly. The trend toward a remote workforce makes Spokane even more attractive to those looking for a, a safe, secure community and will add pressure, more pressure, to an already tight market. Home ownership, especially in the lower end of the market, has seen additional barriers. And despite some expansion in multifamily inventory, rents have been rising. The past couple of years of significant market acceleration added pressure that is very, very real now. How to create enough and the right kinds of housing has been a challenge, and the task got progressively more difficult as the market took off, inventory dropped, and the economic uncertainty hit. Concern is also growing about the ability of tenants to pay their rent. Looming on the horizon is a potential wave of renters who have fallen behind on monthly payments and for the near term remain in their homes because of temporary eviction protections. Landlords have also felt the economic pinch of inconsistent rent payments. Federal and state rental assistance funds will help limit the pandemic impacts, but will likely not be enough to cover the full extent of the challenge. Studies show that we must create more entry-level housing and strategies to invite new opportunities for people to move up. City staff has begun creating a housing inventory to get a current handle on that need. I think um, home ownership is one of the stabilizing factors in a community. I mean, it really does contribute to community vitality. When a family has um, a home, a place that they really can truly call their own, um, they really do thrive, I think, in, in much deeper ways. 
you know, this whole area has had so much affordable housing removed and this was a historic building, it was providing affordable housing, and we just said, this one's got to stay. We have a new library coming in, it's just like kitty corner across the street. We got this housing development that's moving to its new location. So this opportunity for this neighborhood to see growth and investment is critical to East Central. And this is something I call the heart of Spokane, where you see a building that was preserved and moved and created so we can have income qualified individuals be able to stay in a wonderful neighborhood that's going to be poised for growth and it shows the heart of what people in Spokane would like to see. What you're seeing is not unique to Spokane but what you see is an opportunity for us to have something new that is not shared within the rest of the state is that how can we have this level of smart growth. That's the conversation that we're going to have and that's what the future looks like for the city of Spokane. We're also uh, working with community and stakeholders to understand and address the history of housing discrimination in Spokane and try to come up with strategies that will um, overcome the inequities that we see in housing through policies like redlining and restrictive covenants that are no longer legal but still have impacts in our neighborhoods today. I think COVID has really reminded us of the importance of home. It's really reinforced for many of us how important um, a safe place to live is. We hope to encourage affordable and inclusive neighborhoods that minimizes residential displacement, particularly for communities who have been historically marginalized. The basic concept of Sinto Commons is that the people who live there will have lower incomes, but, but they'll be able to live within their means, within their budget. In any kind of um, development like this, uh, it really does take a village, literally, a village of partners. Um, and so we were really grateful to the city of Spokane, for example, because the city provided us uh, with a loan with very favorable terms um, to help us finance uh, the project. Housing needs have changed over time based on demographics and population growth. Uh, changes in preferences and so the housing action plan will help us better meet our community's needs today as well as into the future and better respond to uh, our changing community. If I could wrap it up there's the three P's protect housing, preserve vulnerable renters and produce more housing stock and I think that that's the direction that we're headed and there's many more conversations that we're going to have but it's an exciting future for the city of Spokane. And it's critical right now that no one city government or nonprofit organization can do this alone. It's really going to take all of us. So it's going to take the nonprofit sector, the private sector, and our local government partners to really rebuild our communities and make them better for not only those families, but for all of us. When those families thrive and when they do better, I tell you, we all do better. Managing the city's housing needs will require creative solutions, smart use of density, and a close look at the many factors that influence housing and neighborhoods. That includes transportation, employment and income, access to services and parking. Appropriately timed funding strategies aligned to the right uses, even if they may be different than originally imagined, will also be important considerations. Just as you have all experienced, our work over the past year was temporarily redirected to focus on restoring construction to essential status. That was to minimize any disruptions in the progress we've already made. City planning and building inspections also had to adjust to meet new safety requirements while keeping projects moving. Planning and advisory group meetings slowed as some of our city staff joined the regional response to COVID and we shifted as an organization and community to a new way of meeting and gathering. The good news is, Last year's construction valuation of $585 million was the highest in at least 20 years. This year, new housing starts came in at a record pace in January and February. That's great news to a community that desperately needs to increase its housing stock as part of a broader strategy to create more and affordable housing options. Housing inventory is also a key driver in how we manage homelessness in our region and how we expand our economic base. That will continue to be true even as we get a clearer picture about how much a remote and distributed workforce 
will continue to play in our future. Current public health guidance has more people than ever working from home. Consequently, office buildings are largely vacant and the neighborhood businesses those workers have historically supported are struggling to make ends meet in this new world. Reduced business and recreational traffic have also shined a brighter light on the region's unsheltered individuals and families and added a level of concern that current economic conditions will only add to the challenge. As a city, we've made an important shift in how we best meet the needs of the homeless members in our community. Large concentrations of resources and the accompanying populations of those seeking them has placed a heavy disproportionate burden on our downtown. As we learn and expand our strategies to move people through and out of homelessness so that it is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring, we're doing a much better job of leveraging our resources to address this very regional need. This is one of the tremendous bright spots that has come out of the community's response to COVID. The city and its regional partners recognized early on that the homeless in our community were among the many vulnerable populations that would require a concerted, collaborative effort to keep healthy and to slow the spread of illness. It was out of that necessity that opportunity really began to show itself. The city joined Spokane County, Spokane Valley, and the Spokane Regional Health District at the virtual table to discuss short-term public health strategies to keep people connected to services. Those conversations have evolved into growing longer-term regional partnerships that will make a major difference in how we help people advance in life. Among the many steps forward, the three regional governments meet regularly to discuss impact reduction strategies. Now that might not sound like a lot, but it's been critical to our collective work. Together we've secured a building and an operator for a new night-by-night drop-in center for homeless adults that will eventually transition to a bridge shelter program to move people quickly into permanent housing once this pandemic has passed. It's also helped us completely remodel the existing city drop-in shelter at Cannon Street, added temporary housing for women on the Lower South Hill, and established a safer air center during the wildfire season. We're working together and provided greater flexibility within the regional funded and private shelter system by securing state dollars for a young adult shelter to meet a regional need. The partnership has also built a non-congregate sheltering strategy during this pandemic to protect homeless individuals and families most likely to contract COVID. We're now preparing to seek proposals for an organization to operate a new day shelter that has been identified as another regional need. All of that progress has happened over the past year because of renewed relationships, identified needs and priorities, and smart strategy for the good of the community. Other cities, they've taken a much different approach. Many have essentially thrown up their hands at the overwhelming challenge of meeting the needs during a very demanding time. But in true, resilient Spokane fashion, our partners kept after it and continue to find ways to overcome the challenge in front of us. We're doing hepatitis A vaccines and then we're also doing a little bit of education about COVID and asking people how they're feeling and if they know what symptoms to look for for COVID. That is the, uh, the city's mission is to be more holistic at our approach at homelessness, to provide those, uh, those much needed amenities to them so they can, they can have the ability to get moving out of homelessness. And the mayor has been so instrumental in having that regional approach uh, to especially homelessness. So we can look at it as a regional effort um, and have all of us really come up with the best thoughts and the best ideas for the citizens in our area. Two, three. This Mental Health Crisis Stabilization Center is going to provide us the opportunity for law enforcement and first responders to be people in need here to get the help that they need so they're not sitting in our jail, which helps our taxpayers, it helps our whole system, it helps those individuals so they can get back into society and be productive members in our community. We're looking at a building that we rebuilt basically from the ground up. Not intentionally, but as, as we dug deeper into the project, the 
architects and engineers realized that the building had some integrity structural issues that were uncovered. This building needed to be a true public asset and to do that it needed to be safe for the people that it's going to be housing. Originally during this whole COVID situation uh, most of these homeless were um, actually staying at the arena and then but during that process we were able to secure this building and then quickly do a quick remodel in the building so as the arena ended those folks moved into here and we've had some great success stories of people uh, coming through the doors and, and uh, getting a job and then moving off into regular housing. So we are so excited to be here in the new Hope House that'll be opening this April. It couldn't have been done without a collaboration with the city, county, and our private funders who came through to make sure women weren't sleeping on the street of Spokane anymore. So at the end of the COVID shelter time, we are gonna move this uh, shelter into a, what we call a phase two and three shelter. It's a transitional shelter. We don't wanna just be a Band-Aid. We wanna be a place that last year, 200 people got jobs. That's what we're about, ending homelessness. They come in here if they need a uh, drug and alcohol treatment, we'll send them to that, or if they just need job training, we'll help them get that. So we collaborate with all the other agencies here in town to find the best solution for our guests that are here. Because we truly believe that everybody has the ability to thrive and everybody has the ability to give back to our great community. And that's why this shelter is called the Way Out Shelter. It is the way out. You come to us, we provide a way out of that situation to be a productive member of society. To be honest, the Way Out Shelter probably saved my life. As simple as that. The Way Out Shelter definitely gives you hope. And that's probably the biggest thing is the compassion, the hope. It will turn your life around if you have a place like that to go. Each one of these successes has a story behind it and one major commonality. A relentless focus on the outcomes needed for individuals, families, provider partners, businesses, and neighborhoods. Though sometimes competing interests and the intense passion that comes with it bring their own set of considerations, it can also deliver tremendous rewards. Effectively ending homelessness is more than finding shelter space and moving people into housing. It also requires more opportunities for employment, sustained business success, and keeping Spokane top of mind for recruitment and expansion. Connecting these pieces as a city, making sure as an organization we're investing in the right things that keep Spokane competitive in the marketplace, and working with our regional partners to land new opportunities are critical to our success. One year ago, our path looked a lot smoother. The economy was growing, consumer confidence and activity was strong, businesses were expanding and hiring. The plan was to focus on growing that momentum already in place. Our work over the past year, though, has since adapted. It now includes interim steps to support the small businesses that make up the backbone of our economy and preparing Spokane to be ready when the national economy begins to churn again. Restrictions on public movement and gatherings have been significant, a significant part of the public health plan to slow the spread of COVID. The approach has severely, though, impacted Spokane's economy, which is heavily dependent on small businesses, hospitality, and tourism. Over the past 12 months, we've redirected the focus of economic development from building on the momentum that existed to restarting our economy. And that's another area where our community's willingness to work together has really shined. Finding creative ways to drive traffic to businesses while following public health guidance during this pandemic. The city has sought partnerships to brainstorm ideas, leverage resources, and generate support for small businesses and leisure activities. Creative collaborative approaches have salvaged community fireworks displays to safely celebrate the 4th of July in New Year. The approach helped us establish new holiday traditions as well with a socially distant winter marketplace that showcases local vendors, reopen recreational amenities like the Ice Ribbon in Riverfront Park, and support neighborhood business districts with marketing efforts to generate traffic to local businesses. Those efforts supplemented small business grants that the city distributed from federal relief dollars to help businesses cover unmet expenses due to loss of revenue. Long-term vitality will come from rebuilding the core economic drivers and being prepared to capitalize on new COVID distance economic opportunities.
There's things that we did in 2020 that were a huge success that, you know what, we'll probably continue to that down the path in the future. And one of those was just behind me uh, where we had the winter market. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. And that's one thing too that we looked at is how can we use our activation as a support for local businesses. <laughs> and one of the biggest activations that we had was the Manitou drive through lights. We saw like local restaurants saying, hey, while you're waiting in line for the Manitou lights for over two hours, don't forget about calling in your takeout. <laughs> we had almost 60,000 people come through the Manitou lights within 10 nights. Well, we were gonna have a, a early shutdown this year and it's helped us stay open probably another month and a half. We've had projects canceled this year uh, pushed off till next year and this really has helped us kind of fill in the rest of our year. Typically one million dollars in public construction investment equals to about 10 to 20 very good paying jobs in our community. So this is more important now than ever before. Well this morning we're preparing chili and cornbread what the city's doing is creating what's called a loan loss reserve and what that does is it allows us to make loans with less underwriting scrutiny so that we can get that money out on the street faster. The city is truly helping us help companies today, not two weeks from now, not a month from now. They're also buying down the interest rate against what we would normally be able to provide for this kind of a loan. So the interest rate is a 5% fixed loan for the life of the loan. That will let us pay for our leases, our utilities. The city is doing a really important thing by providing this resource during this downturn to carry people through to normalcy or what our new sense of normalcy will be. The idea is to make it easy to access and affordable to pay back, but also readily available to the businesses that are struggling. Soulful soups. Yes, we have tomato basil, beer cheese. Well, you know, in this town, uh, private business and everyday people are what drive this town. Government, though, has some powers to make things happen. We are catalysts for positive change. And when city council can look at existing rules and tweak them and make things work smoother and set private business free, that's what we do. Dining pleasure. It gives us that community that we wanted. That, that, the, the energy that usually exists in here is just going to be out on the street now. To be able to maximize what little options they had during this shutdown, and that was through takeout, curbside pickup, was huge. And the fact that we could offer them uh, some help from the city just with a 10-minute free parking goes a long way. It's made us still viable. We can still go on Facebook, we're showing our food, we're viable, we're trying. And I think people respect that because they always thank us. Thank you for being open. She is taking things that she can do. We realize that she's under a blanket too. She can only do so much. And, but, but what she's done, has been, it's been helpful. Golf was one of those early winners working with the state on of how can we safely get golfers back out on the courses. And what was interesting was it was not just existing golfers, it was new golfers, it was families. We're really excited about 2021. I mean, obviously there was going to still have some challenges, but there's going to be creative solutions. We are extremely hopeful and positive about what is just ahead for our region. Thanks to the selfless hard work of our community, case counts, are as low as they've been since mid-September and are consistently lower than the holiday peaks. Vaccine distribution is growing by the thousands each week. Collaboration with other partners and state agencies have never been more robust. The partnership with the Spokane Regional Health District, as you saw, is strong and growing. We've convened the East Region Mayors and are in continuing conversations with them about specific needs for our communities. Discussions with mayors like Liberty Lake, Millwood, Spokane Valley, Airway Heights, Medical Lake and Cheney are happening regularly. Communication with the governor's office has become much more consistent and provided an opportunity for us to give greater input. The result is 
Our healthcare system is operating at a sustainable level. Students are spending more time in classrooms. Businesses are seeing an uptick in traffic and the convention and tourism activities that our community relies so heavily on are beginning to schedule events again. And our economy will take the next safe and measured step to open even more on Monday, based in part on the recommendations and feedback from East Region leaders. Mostly though, we have hope. Hope that once we've seen our way through this pandemic, the lessons we've learned will live on and the results of the struggles will be more meaningful for years to come. I wanna thank all of you for watching and listening today, for being part of pulling together as one community. We appreciate the sacrifice, commitment, and resiliency when your community needed you most. That kind of support will continue to be needed moving forward, and we're confident you are up to the challenge because it's what Spokane does best. Hey guys, this is Jim up here in the Garland District. How's it going folks? I'm Aaron Fiorini at Market Street Pizza Parlor. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Chef Alex Santos Kuklon. I'm the corporate chef for Thai Bamboo. I am Victoria, your friendly bra whisperer. And as you can see, things look a little different in our shop right now due to COVID-19. We've been doing our best to adapt and make changes to keep customers coming through. We have been trying to stay innovative as much as possible and we actually launched our own mobile app which you can um, download and place your order and we can even bring it out to your car if you would like us to. And I'm learning new things myself. Do you know when you hit that go live button on Facebook, everybody can see you. So we do live videos twice a week. We've also installed eight brand new state-of-the-art heaters that are out here uh, for people to sit out and dine. Very comfortable, putting off a great heat. We do a free Uber Eats delivery. We bring curbside assistance. Even if you call in an order, you can pay over the phone. We have online touchless service. So again, guys, it's collectibles in the Garland District and come on up and see us because there's a lot of shops that are having a really hard time and we would love for you to shop local and you know, come on out and help us out. Go out and support local, it doesn't just have to be us. So it's more important now than ever that you make it out to these local businesses and support them so that when all this is over, uh, we still have these guys around. And I want you all to remember to be kind to each other, but remember to buy local and give local. That's what makes Spokane great. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, really inspiring. And as I think about partnership and collaboration and the opportunity ahead, just a huge thank you to you and to the city of Spokane for being here today and for this conversation. We have time for a couple of questions. So we're okay. gonna jump right in and uh, be cognizant of time. Uh, the first question is a little bit to just the very end of your remarks around reopening. and. A question from Nathan Dykes around the city's plan to relax restrictions with the COVID numbers dropping so drastically. Um, curious what that plan is and also around full school reopening. And certainly we know you don't have all the control in that, but would love to talk <laughs> um, on both of those issues as we think about um, reopening. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to have input on what that relaxation um, looks like with the governor's office. I just had a meeting this week with the East Region's mayors. It was a fantastic conversation. And the first thing that came up was, what are we gonna do to provide input for the governor's phase four plan? Um, most of us uh, were reticent to say, well, let's get to phase three first, but those conversations will continue. And when we gave uh, several weeks ago, the East Region mayors gave a long list of suggestions to the governor's office. Many of those suggestions can definitely be used. In, in phase four. So we'll continue to um, come up with recommendations and, and provide that input to the governor's office. Thanks, Mayor. And I think okay. it's important that our audience knows that much of those restrictions is something you have the ability to influence and advocate for, but the, the yes. decision making happens at the state level. Absolutely. Um, the second question is from Lars Gilberts. And the question is, what are your top priorities or projects to fund with the new stimulus dollars coming to the city? Well, we're expecting to get quite uh, a bit of money from the federal government, uh, anywhere between 80 and $84 million. So that's a great question, Lars. So we're having conversations right now 
about what those projects and priorities are because we want to collaborate uh, between the mayor's office and the city council on, on many of those. We'd like to listen to the community as well. But we definitely want to get that money deployed into the community as soon as possible, but also be intentional about um, programs or projects or funding that is an investment in our community. And what I mean by investment, I mean that brings revenue further on down the road because our economic recovery is not going to end in 2021, 22, or 23. So those are the kinds of conversations and I think lens that we need to look through is investments now that reap benefits down the road. So we have uh, two questions here that keep trading, trading spots in the upvote. The audience is using the upvote, which is awesome. <laughs> the next question is um, from Maxine Lammers. And the question is, jobs come ahead of home ownership. Given the high need and the trades, are there ways we can create more opportunities in this arena? We absolutely need to. You know, Spokane Workforce has done a great job of using this opportunity during the pandemic. People who have lost their jobs and are on unemployment finding them opportunities to gain a new trade or a new skill set so that when we're on the other side of this pandemic, they're in a better position to be in employment or a job that's much more um, stabilizing. Uh, we do have a uh, business sector. I mean, our region is, is uh, reliant on jobs that many of them are um, minimum wage jobs. Those are the hospitality and tourism jobs. But we need to do a better job, though, of, of, of training our workforce, too. So that uh, when, if we were to ever have a, a dip like we have now in, in our economy, that they can get the resources to retrain and be better on the other side of this. So we are focusing on that. Thank you. And this will be our last question, which really gets at two of them that we have here. And this one came uh, via Facebook. Can you address the long delays on permitting right now? It's really just wanting to hear about businesses that are backing out of investing in our community due to the process. I, I hear uh, concerns about that from the community, whether they're builders or, or developers. Uh, let me just say that uh, in 2020, we did have record construction valuation. Um, our permitting office was robust. And in uh, that process, having to work remotely and having to set up a system where people can work from home. Um, I think the communication makes it a little bit harder sometimes when you're in that remote environment. Uh, the first two months of this year, as I mentioned, housing starts, record pace. They're keeping up as quickly as they can. I think they're trying to do the best job they can. There's always room for improvement, and we'll focus on that. Well, thank you, Mayor. And if you, uh, the virtual audience, join me in a, both a round of applause and a thank you to the mayor and her team for their leadership on behalf of our city and our region. And it's awesome to have you live from the podium. Yeah. Celebrate the official grand opening. <laughs> really thank awesome. you, Alicia. You're welcome.